So welcome to our, our Wednesday weekly webinar. I'll be both your moderator and your host today. Um, this is Julie Garden-Robinson. I'm a food and nutrition specialist with the NDSU Extension Service, and I thank you for joining us. We have a couple of sessions left in our weekly webinars. Next week you'll hear from Chandra and David. Um, if you are running a business or a farmer's market, something like that, they're going to talk about food safety inspections, audit requirements, um, and what is expected and required at this point. There are some rules that are changing as we're going, so this will be a really important session to take a look at. And then our last session will feature Cliff Hall, whom some of you may have attended his session last week, and myself, and we're going to talk a little bit about food labels, ingredients, and allergens, as we've taken you all the way from the field to the fork in our webinars. These are all going to be archived, and they will be on the website. Everyone's in listening mode, but please go ahead and type your questions. I'll try to remember to glance over as I'm talking. And certainly, after the session, feel free to email me or call me. I am going to be out of my office for the next week, um, but I'll be back the last week of April. So there will be a short survey once again at the end of the webinar. Um, this is all funded by a grant, so your responses are really important to us. So please take a couple minutes, that's all it will take, to answer those. And we will be sending out some prizes based on random drawings of those of you who have registered your names after the survey. You also will be able to, to print out a certificate. So you will get credit. For example, if you're a master gardener, this will count toward continuing education credits. So my topic today is called Facts and Myths About Food Preservation. Food preservation is not exactly like your grandma used to do, so I hope to dispense some of the myths that keep coming up, especially if you go on the internet to look up information, you can find some information that is not correct. So I want to assure you that we do have lots of free and accurate information based on research tested guidelines. So. So again, we're going to take a look at facts and myths. I will provide information about current food preservation recommendations. And I hope we have a little fun in the process as we go along. I like to try to get people involved when I give webinars. So I might ask you to raise your hand or give me a smile now and then as we go through this. So I'll, I'll start off with a thumbs up, or I guess that would be your, your response. If you think this is true, Give me a thumbs up. Old church cookbooks have great canning recipes you will want to use. Okay, am I seeing any thumbs up? Actually, there might be some good recipes you may want to use. However, often the old church cookbooks have outdated and often unsafe canning recipes. The reason is that food preservation research began in earnest prior to World War II and during World War II. And prior to that, some of the things that people are continuing to do and are finding online used to be okay until they figured out that, gee, that isn't safe. So the information we have and the USDA offers is based on research in the labs. In 1994, the canning guidelines underwent a major overhaul. So if you have some old extension publications that you might have gotten from us a long time ago, no more than 20 years ago, I would throw it away. <laughs> and I would um, look at our, our current information on our website. Again, in 2006, there was another revision and review of canning guidelines. So everything that we currently have is considered up to date based on those on those rules and guidelines. So what we want people to do is to only follow current research tested canning recipes. And those are from the US Department of Agriculture, from extension services throughout the United States, or companies such as the Ball Corporation that has all the canning jars and different canning mixes. 
they certainly want you to be safe as they are as you are using their their jars and so on. So you can trust their formulations as well. But be very very cautious if you find someone's blog or you find something on Pinterest about canning. You know, really look at that with a critical eye and compare it to one of the tested recipes. Sometimes they use tested recipes. Sometimes they just make up their own thing. So. You know, be a savvy consumer. Another one, you can think about this. I think this is a fact or a myth. As long as you boil the jars of vegetables long enough, you will have a safe end product. Okay, thinking about that, that's actually a myth. Uh, unless you can foods properly, you could put yourself at risk for botulism. And Clostridium botulinum is the organism that can grow within improperly canned foods and produce a toxin in low acid foods in sealed cans or jars. This organism does not grow in, um, in the presence of oxygen. It wants that air free environment or anaerobic environment. Unfortunately, boiling jars at 212 degrees for days on end will not kill this organism or its spores. They're like little inactive seeds. It's a little protective coat that forms around uh, this type of bacteria. So boiling at 212 will not do it. What you have to do is actually pressure can it. And that takes the temperature up to 240 degrees. So this is interesting. I'm not exactly sure how they tested this. You can see on the first bullet, one milligram of pure botulism toxin could kill 655 tons of mice. I actually found that on a university website. Food can contain a toxin without showing any signs. So the jar may look perfectly fine. You may open the jar and, oh, that looks okay. I, I water bath can these green beans. That's not safe. But you wouldn't necessarily be able to tell it's unsafe by looking at it. There is an antitoxin available if you were to get botulism, but there's very slow recovery and permanent nerve damage is possible. Um, botulism is our most deadly form of foodborne illness. Now that I've scared you all, I hope not. Um, these are some additional facts about botulism food poisoning. The symptoms appear within 12 to 72 hours and they may include digestive upset sometimes. Um, blurred vision is kind of a hallmark sign. Double vision would be another sign. Difficulty swallowing, speaking, or breathing. Basically you're it's strangling you, and there's a possible death from suffocation. So it's very, very serious, and that's why we take putting out these canning recommendations so seriously. I look at it multiple times. I compare it back to the original source multiple times just to be sure, because we do not want anyone to become ill from the formulations we put on our website and our publications. And if anything has slipped past us, please let me know as soon as possible. We can correct it very quickly. But I'm pretty confident that it's, it's okay. Quite <laughs> very confident, I should say. Um, if you watched Cliff's talk last week, I believe he might have used this same headline. This is one that I ordered from a newspaper several years ago, and we scanned it for this slide. There was a very deadly botulism outbreak back in 1931 that eventually led to 13 deaths. At the time of this newspaper headline, 12 people had died in Grafton, North Dakota, and the source was improperly home canned vegetables. As you can see from that date, you know, this was prior to the World War II canning um, research that was being done. And so they were still water bath canning, putting in very different, different jars than we use today, and simply heating them. Sometimes they would just heat the food, put it in a jar, let the lid seal, and put it on their shelf. And if they were lucky, the food would spoil and they wouldn't eat it at all. <laughs> if, if it made it through and uh, was allowed to sit on their shelf for a while, the old rule of thumb was to boil the food for at least 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes prior to eating it. Well, as you saw from my credentials, I'm also a nutritionist. And by the time you boil food, 
solid boil for 20 minutes, you're going to lose some of those vitamins and so on that that you're eating the vegetables to to get. So, you know, the best thing to do is to follow the research tested guidelines for safety as well as really good quality. But don't be afraid. It is possible to safely can and otherwise preserve food at home. All right, so now give me a um, raised hand if you think this is a fact. Vegetables, meats, and most mixtures of food should only be canned in a pressure canner. Yeah, I'm seeing a real trend here. <laughs> and you are all correct. If you have your hand raised, that is absolutely the fact. Um, the acidity or the pH, in other words, of a food determines how it needs to be canned. So low acid foods, and those are defined as foods with an acidity level or pH less than 4.6, must be processed in a pressure canner. So those low acid foods include foods such as vegetables, and there's one, um, you know, there is tomatoes that can be acidified, they're a vegetable technically, at least to nutritionists. Meats, poultry, seafood, soups, and mixtures of low and high and low, or mixtures of low and high acid foods would all need to be pressure canned. So mixtures, as a general rule of thumb, need to be pressure canned as well. So keep that in mind, really an important thing. This is where I see things on the internet where they, they aren't following the rules, they're just kind of putting out information that isn't necessarily safe or correct. So you've got to know the, the pH. Um, some other things to remember, yeast, molds, and most bacteria are destroyed at boiling temperatures. So as you'll see later in my presentation, we also recommend that you run your jellies and jams through a water bath for five or ten minutes, and that will kill those yeast and molds. Another thing to remember, this deadly type of bacteria, Clostridium botulinum, will form spores that require higher temperatures. So we need to reach that 240 degree temperature mark or above in order to inactivate these spores. So if you're planning to can any green beans or you know, most of these vegetables that we might be growing this summer around here, you would need to either freeze them if you don't have a pressure canner or get a hold of a pressure canner and make sure that, that you have an accurate gauge on that. Um, if it's a dial gauge, have it checked. Um, you can talk to your, to your county extension agent in most areas and they will do that for a small fee. Another thing to remember, don't confuse a pressure cooker and a pressure canner. Now, if you ever have insomnia and you're up late, they have some devices on TV that aren't necessarily approved for use by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. I've seen some items that basically they're pressure cookers, but they're saying, oh yeah, go ahead and use them for a pressure canner. Technically, according to USDA processes and all these and all this information you'll find on our website. The canner must be big enough to hold at least four quart-sized jars to be considered a pressure canner. And pressure cookers, saucepans, etc., with smaller volume capacities are not recommended for use in canning. So again, all of these have been tested with the larger size pressure canners, and that's you know, that's what we need to recommend because of the research that they've done. So be like, you know, be very skeptical, be very cautious about advertised products and some of that information that we see online. But this is a question that I get quite often, and uh, we actually had a student do some research for us about oven canning. Because I even saw it in a newspaper article about a year ago um, saying, oh, that's a great way to can your food. Actually, it is not. Um, so I've already told you the answer here. Canning in your oven is not safe. 
In fact, it can be extremely dangerous for low acid foods because it doesn't reach or doesn't allow the food to reach that safe inside temperature in that jar. Glass kind of acts like an insulator. And while we're at it, um, so don't can in your oven. Don't can in your microwave. That is not considered safe either. And don't seal your jars in the dishwasher. I've also had people run their canned goods through the dishwasher to seal the, the jars. Not considered safe. You're not getting that food heated to the proper temperature. You can wash your jars in a dishwasher, keep them hot in a dishwasher. That's certainly fine. But dishwashers are meant for cleaning things and not sealing things and not canning things. So if you hear of anybody else, please be our messenger and let them know. You should have received a handout with all of this information on it as well. And if you didn't, it is we have a facts or myths piece that corresponds with this um, presentation on our website. So just some things to, to remember. Well, one of the most popular things to can, as I've noticed in my 20 plus year career with NDSU Extension, is salsa. And that's great for you. Wonderful thing to incorporate in your diet, high in fiber, vitamin C, can't say enough good things about eating salsa. But people like to invent their own salsa recipes. They have their own secret formula. So, factor myth. You can invent your own salsa recipe and can it as long as you process it in a water bath canner. And again, another myth. If you invent your own recipe, I would suggest that you freeze it. You can basically freeze almost anything. Um, you don't have to acidify your tomatoes prior to freezing them as, as you will, you know, if you decide to can them. But it is not safe to just make it up because, again, the acidity is affected. So we have many formulations for salsa that have been tested at various universities for acidity. So find one you like. There's lots of good ones. We've tried them all and tasted them all. But follow them exactly. And you need to weigh and measure the ingredients carefully because when you're canning, you're being a food scientist. And if you decide to throw in a whole bunch of extra onions and peppers just because you like onions and peppers, you've now affected the acidity level of your, of your food product. So here are some other tips for safely canning salsa. You can decrease the spices according to, um, you know, the people who tested it, but you really shouldn't increase them. So you cut them back, but don't increase them. Um, you can substitute one type of pepper for another, but you need to keep the total amount the same. Some people like a thicker salsa, and they may think that, gee, I'd really like to thicken this. I'm going to throw in some cornstarch or flour or whatever, and you really shouldn't do that because that will affect that thickness or viscosity will affect how well the heat penetrates and kills any organisms that might be present. So don't thicken it. You can always open the jar, thicken it after, or better yet, I guess I would just pour off some of the extra liquid or strain it, and that will thicken it after you uh, open the jar. But we don't want to thicken it before. Another thing, a more of a safety for you and for your skin is that you really should handle the peppers carefully because you can burn yourself and let's say your eye gets a little itchy and you reach up and you scratch your eye, you could burn your eye. Uh, so be really careful. You can see in this photo that the students who were making this were wearing plastic gloves. So be, be cautious. But peppers are outstanding in terms of nutrition. They're one of our best sources of vitamin C that we have. And they also have fiber and, and so on. OK, I'm going to have you um, take down your hands if your hands are still up. And give me a smile if you think this is a fact.
Acid such as lemon juice or citric acid should be added to all tomatoes prior to canning. So, I saw a few smiles out there. You were smiling. Pat yourself on the back. Because that is true. And we did some research, um, well, last year, a couple of years ago, and also several years ago, just comparing the acidity levels of different tomato varieties out of the research, um, the research office um, in the western part of the state. And we also did some testing locally on campus. And we found that the tomato varieties can vary in the amount of acid they contain, both depending on the variety and also the growing season. Was it hot? Was it cool? Was it rainy? So for safety, USDA actually has all tomatoes being acidified prior to being canned in either a water bath canner or a pressure canner. And I think they add it to the pressure can um, vegetables just to avoid confusion. Technically, you wouldn't have to, <laughs> I will say that, but they do add it to all to all, and they, they would have created their pressure canner times based on the acidity of those tomatoes. So please follow the rule. If it says add two tablespoons of bottled lemon juice per quart, add it. The other substance you can add to acidify the food would be a half teaspoon of citric acid per quart. Either one will decrease the pH enough for safety. So don't forget that. That is something that a lot of people are not aware of. So again, if you know other people and you know they're going to be canning tomatoes because they grow so well here, please remind them that we do have this recommendation. It comes nationally from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Because of the way consumers like a product that maybe isn't quite so acidic as what maybe the heirlooms used to be, therefore, now we need to add that acid back for safety. I'll pause. Does anyone have any questions? Okay. Mixtures like relishes. That came from Annie in Colorado. Um, the relishes would, I think you're referring back to um, pressure canning, and I'm sorry I missed your question earlier, but relishes would be acidified. Um, mixtures of food would include soups, for example, the vegetable soup that you might want to can. Um, in some cases, salsa is, is actually pressure canned. So that's a good question. But acidified foods like relish made from you know, cucumbers and so on with added acid would be safe to water bath can. I'll, I'll try to keep my eye closer over on, on my uh, little chat box. Okay, and then you can read the comment over there. I've been seeing, I've been using oven to seal jars when doing jams, jellies, and preserves. Um, we don't recommend that for that purpose either. We do recommend the water bath canning process. Again, that water will help the heat penetrate better than an oven. And our students who tried oven canning we actually inoculated the jars of, I think it was green beans, with bacteria. And they were able, the bacteria was able to survive oven canning. So the best thing to do, safest thing to do, highest quality thing to do is to simply follow these, these guidelines because people have built, you know, dedicated their lives <laughs> to studying food preservation to be sure it's safe for consumers. So back to my slide. These acidic foods can be canned in a water bath canner. So jams and jellies, various fruit sauces, fruit products, pickles, 
fruit sauces, uh, yams, certain salsas, tomatoes, if they've been acidified. Okay, another one to think about. Ponder this for a second. Most vegetables do not require heat blanching prior to freezing. That's actually a myth. That would be false. Uh, for best quality, vegetables should be heat treated or blanched. And that's usually done in boiling water. can be done in steam. But boiling water is probably your best bet. And there are recommended lengths of time for each different vegetable. And we have several handouts. In fact, one of our handouts we have available on our website lists about every food we could think of in order to freeze it, plus a lot of other foods. So it's called a food freezing guide. So if you just Google NDSU Extension food freezing guide, you'll find almost every food. And it'll tell you exactly how to treat it. So why blanch food? Um, it in inactivates the enzymes that can cause changes in flavor and color and overall quality. And enzymes themselves are small proteins that regulate the processes in our body or in the plant stem or the plant leaf. So we all have enzymes. And in the case of freezing, we want to inactivate those enzymes so that they don't keep doing their job and keep breaking down the, um, you know, the plant structure, for example. So it's not necessarily a big safety issue. So if you throw whatever vegetable in the freezer without blanching it first, it isn't going to hurt you uh, at all. In fact, some people don't bother to, to blanch tomatoes, for example. I don't blanch tomatoes, uh, especially if I'm going to freeze those tomatoes and then usually, or later, make that into salsa. It's, it's a quality thing, but we do recommend it because most people like a high quality product. So we'll simply follow, you know, follow the freezing guide um, if you want to have your best quality product. If you want to avoid undesirable flavor, texture, color changes. So another factor myth. You can freeze foods in cool whip containers, margarine containers, and other clean plastic containers that previously held food. And we're really more getting at the, the quality of those, those foods here. So yes, you can, of course. You can put, do whatever you want in your house. <laughs> but for best quality, again, you want to use freezer containers. Usually, using these plastic containers that you get free, you know, as part of your food you're buying, um, could lead to freezer burn, dehydration. Freezer burn is a quality issue. It's not a safety issue. But what we're talking about today is both quality and safety. So for best quality, you want to use freezer containers. Um, freezer burn can cause color changes. You might see, you know, it might look frosty. You might taste some very off, you probably all tried <laughs> freezer burn meat at some time in your life if it wasn't quite packed right, for example. So you might see these undesirable quality changes. So avoid that by using freezer bags, uh, freezer containers. There's lots of different items available in the canning section of many stores. So these are some properties to look for if you're buying packaging materials. You want it to be moisture and vapor resistant. You're trying to keep the moisture and air in and just keep that, keep your product as high quality as possible. So look for durable and leak proof materials. You don't, you do not want materials that become brittle and crack. You also want these materials to be resistant to oil, grease, or water. And you want to protect your food from off flavors or odors that might be around it. So just having these high quality freezing materials, like you can see some in the little picture on the screen, will help you have the best quality, most nutritious food. But again, freezing is less, I mean, that's very safe. If you've never 
preserve food before, freezing is a good place to start. Be sure to label after you've sealed these packages as well, or you could end up with some surprises. Uh, so you don't want to have a bunch of containers like, oh, I'll remember what's in that, and we all forget that. So be sure to seal them properly and also label them. Well, I thought this was kind of interesting information if we think about storage life. Um, another piece of information you might find that valuable is our food storage guide. So if you simply Google NDSU Extension Food Storage Guide, it's another long publication with lots of different foods listed and the storage life that most will have is stored at you know, the optimum temperature. So the colder the temperature, as you can see, the longer it will last. So generally we say about a year. Um, zero degrees, you can keep that frozen food about a year. If we drop or if we raise that temperature to five degrees, six months, get higher, the food is still going to be frozen at 20, but now we're at about three weeks of best quality. And once it reaches 30 degrees, just right below, you know, it's basically you know, refrigerator temperature almost, just five days. So the colder, the better. And if you're freezing food, you definitely will want to use. Make sure that your freeze, your frozen storage unit, your freezer, is kept cold. Zero degrees Fahrenheit is the optimum temperature. So it's a good, good thing to have a thermometer in your freezer. So again, check out that food storage guide. I think a lot of people use that regularly. Okay, another factor myth. You can use glass mayonnaise jars to can food, such as peach sauce. So raise your hand if you think this is correct. Did I fool anyone with this one? Let me see here. Okay, it's kind of a fact. Um, they are safe to use, but Mason type jars are the best choice for canning. Uh, what USDA says is that you should expect more seal failures and potential breakage when you reuse commercial glass jars. However, as some people pointed out when I've given this presentation previously, you can't buy very many mayonnaise jars anymore that are glass. Most things are plastic. So if you have old ones, um, you know, it's, it's an iffy situation. Uh, mayonnaise jars have a narrower sealing surface and they're tempered less. They're less strong than ma mason jars, the standard canning jars. So, you know, it is allowable for things such as fruit sauce and that type of thing, but again, you might have seal failures. The mayonnaise jars, glass jars, may have been weakened if they had lots of contact with metal spoons or knives as people get some mayo to put on a sandwich. The, the rule of thumb, however, is that you never want to use glass mayonnaise type jars in a pressure canner because there's a very high risk of jar breakage. And just the other day, my program assistants were testing some recipes for us. Um, in our food lab just down the hall, and came in because the, they were using the right type of jars, doing everything right. The bottom of the jar broke off in the water bath canner, and of course, everything that was in that jar was now throughout <laughs> the water bath canner. So once in a while, you do end up with a commercial jar that has somehow become weakened. Maybe someone dropped it along the way or something happened during the whole shipping process. So even those commercial jars that you buy wherever you like to shop could be weakened and once in a while it happens. I was pretty surprised to see that the bottom had fallen off the jar as well. But fortunately no one was hurt and, and we all learned something in the process. Okay, factor myth. Paraffin wax provides an excellent seal on jelly and jam jars. 
And I know I grew up having uh, jelly and jams covered with paraffin wax, but currently it is not recommended. Uh, it is not considered to provide an airtight seal. And you can have spoilage occurring, which can cause mold growth. So the recommendation is to use two-piece self-sealing lids on jams and jellies, like the one shown in the picture. And after that jar has been sealed, so we would take the jar, fill it, put the lid and the ring on it, put it in the boiling water, let it be for five to ten minutes, depending on what the formula is. And after that comes out, you hear the little ping. When it's cool, you take off the rings. I sometimes see people who leave the rings on all the time, and technically, um, you're supposed to take those off. So, so no paraffin wax, two-piece rings, but you can take the rings off after it's sealed. And the reason they have you do that is sometimes, depending on where they're stored, you can have some rust, rusting occur, and you might not be able to get that, that ring off very easily. So I've mentioned this already, but I'm just going to reiterate that we do recommend processing all jams and jellies in a water bath canner, and the reason is to inactivate mold, yeast, and bacteria. And after about 12 hours, take off the screw bands. I'd like to just pause and tell you a little story. This happened several years ago. I was pretty new in my job, and someone called me because she had made raspberry jam, and she was wondering why the jam jars were exploding in her closet where she was keeping them. And after, you know, we talked through the process, and I think she'd used our recipe, or, I, you know, she'd used a good recipe and so on. That was a tested recipe, but she had skipped the water bath canning process. And therefore, there were still some molds or probably yeast that produced gas. And after it produced enough gas, it, they popped the lids off the jars, and some of the jars actually blew up. So, you know, <laughs> not something you want. She was not happy because, of course, cleaning up a whole bunch of raspberry jam all over a storage closet would not be a nice thing to do. So that's one of the, that really um, nailed it down in my mind, I guess, that we always want to process those jams and jellies and use the right lids and not paraffin. All right, another one to think about. Pickles are so acidic that they do not need to be processed in a water bath canner. And often people will skip this step, so you can guess that that is a myth. Um, again, we're trying to inactivate mold yeast and even some bacteria that can survive in very acidic environments. Pickles generally have uh, added acid, vinegar, for example. So we do, again, have the recommendation for processing pickles in a water bath canner for the recommended amount of time. The safety, very much a safety consideration. So here are some pickling rules directly from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. We do not recommend that people alter the amount of vinegar or the amount of food or the water proportions in a recipe or use vinegar with an unknown acidity. I've had some people call me and say that, gee, I'm going to make my own vinegar. Well, unless you're a chemist, and you can test the acidity. Uh, we do want people to use vinegar that says 5% acetic acid. Acetic acid is the type of acid in vinegar that gives it its aroma and taste and also acidity. So it's vin vinegar itself has been diluted to down to 5% acetic acid. It comes in your gallon jars or quart jar or quart containers. Um, and check on the label that it says that. And you also want to only use recipes with tested proportions of ingredients. They want, they do this testing, and it's quite a process for a recipe to reach the point where it's listed on the USDA National Center for Home Food Preservation. They test it multiple times in multiple ways. So again, 
goes back to the acidity level, there must be a, un a uniform minimum level of acid throughout the mixed product to prevent the growth of this botulinum bacteria. So again, just following the rules and looking out for the source of your recipe. Well, often in my career I get the question, what is happening to my jar lids? They're popping open after a while. And so what do you think of this question? You can raise your hand if you think this is correct. Screw bands should be tightened fingertip tight prior to canning. So should we really heavily tighten those or should we just do it fingertip tight? Alright, if you have your hand raised, pat yourself on the back. In fact, what they recommend that you use is your thumb and your ring finger. Don't over tighten because that can lead to seal failures. And if any of you are experienced canners and have experienced seal failures in more recent years, I would like to let you know that they have changed the type of sealant in lids in the last few years. In fact, if you plant a can, you know, August, September, whenever we have nice produce available to us, be sure that you read the lid box. Some of our lids now no longer say to heat them prior to putting them on the jar. And that's, you know, standard practice in our publications for many years to say, you know, put the, simmer some water and put the lids in the water. Well, last year and in the last couple of years I've been getting a lot of calls from people saying, I am having, my jars aren't sealing or they're popping open after a couple of weeks. Well, they were boiling their lids and because they changed the sealant or that kind of rubbery type seal, that was affecting how well it adhered the jar to the lid. So follow the rules. I guess that's my best rule of thumb. And when you put the screw band on top, don't over tighten. So don't get the most, the strongest person in your household to come in and really put it on tight. That's not what you want to do. Uh, another thing I've mentioned on this particular slide is don't reuse the lids. Uh, there are some lids out on the market that you can buy in different stores that say they're reusable. And I've asked the, the director of the National Center for Food Preservation what she thinks of those. They're called Tatler lids. They're white. And her opinion, because the USDA Center has not tested them, is that, you know, they can't guarantee that they'll work as they should. Um, they just don't have the answer to that. So if you do choose to use those, kind of proceed at your own caution because, you know, our national offices haven't tested those. So the general type of lid like I have in the picture would not be reusable. And whether those other ones are reusable remains questionable until they come out with research that shows, yep, they work every time. Otherwise, you could end up wasting food and all the work that goes into canning. Factor myth. All jams and jellies are loaded with sugar. That's actually a myth. We have lots of jam and jelly recipes that can be made nowadays with no sugar or with sugar substitutes. Now, the thing to remember, if if you are trying to avoid so much sugar in your diet or, you know, trying to remove some, that you do need to follow the tested formulations and there are special types of pectin that you would need to use. These types of pectin, that's what forms the gel within the product, are specially designed, created, so that they work with less sugar. So you can't just cut back on the sugar and use regular pectin. You need to find the exact one that it calls for and follow that to a T for a successful and safe 
jelly product or jam product. Some of our recipes that are available on the National um, Food Preservation website also use Splenda or other low calorie, low sugar sweeteners. So again, follow the, follow the directions and you should have a safe product. We've tested several of these this winter in our food lab and they are producing a nice quality product. So if you don't find the type of jam or jelly that you're looking for on our NDSU Extension website and all our long list of publications, also remember the National Center for Home Food Preservation has many additional jam, jelly, salsa, and so on formulations. So in uh, wrapping up, um, just have a few slides left. I hope that you enjoy food preservation. I certainly hope I haven't frightened you <laughs> with any of this information, but we do want you to be safe. It does take effort. It's, it's quite a process to, to do some of this canning and freezing and drying and whatever you decide to do. But always remember to use the current research tested recipes and our rule of thumb for best quality, try to use those canned goods up within a year. They're going to remain safe much longer than that, but not for decades. I also get lots of questions where someone is cleaning out a family home and they find 20 or 30 year old canned goods. You don't want to use them <laughs> after that amount of time. So try to use them within this, you know, fairly short time frame. One year is best. It's going to be just like you can. And I guess I'm ready for any other questions anyone might have. Let me go check and see if there's any more in my chat pod. Any questions for me? There will be a survey that will be emailed out to you if you registered online. We ask that you fill it out. Um, some other canning and food preservation information that we have on our website includes three publications about how to dry fruits and vegetables, make fruit leathers. So if you want to try that, that's a really easy thing to do, especially with children. If you have a food dehydrator, very simple to do. Um, mention the freezing. We're working on some things related to food fermentation because that's become so popular. Currently the only fermented food publication we have is how to make sauerkraut. And if you want to think broadly in terms of food fermentation. We also have a winemaking guide because really that is fermenting um, fruits, I guess, to make alcohol. So if you are a con connoisseur of wine, um, there are some interesting things to try on that. So any questions for me? Don't be afraid to can. <laughs> If there are no questions, certainly feel free to drop me an email. Watch for that follow-up email that should come in the next short while, hopefully, that will have a short survey and, um, you know, we always welcome your feedback. So thank you for attending and please join us again next week and then there's one following next week and then our 10 webinar series will be all done. <laughs>